So I'm here to talk to you about open source zoomable images. And you're probably wondering what those are and what this has to do with the three projects that are mentioned in the title of this talk. But first I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Melinda Minch. Thanks. That should hide my dock. My dock will not be hidden today. I don't know why. It usually goes away by itself, but it's not going to right now. So I used to work at Microsoft Live Labs, which is where I got involved in zooming images in the first place. And one of my co-conspirators there is talking to me about option command key. Um, and he's also one of my co-contributors. In fact, he's the guy who came up with Open Sea Dragon in the first place. So I'm going to pick on him with questions now. Um, <laughs> that, that's Ian there. So in something like 2007, I joined this group inside Microsoft that was doing stuff with zoomable UI. And ever since then, I've been involved in that kind of work. And the stuff that I worked on there has been taken to open source. And that's pretty cool. So these are the three things that I'm involved with. It's zoom.it, so it's a website you can go to called zoom.it. It used to be owned by Microsoft, but they very recently gave up the rights to it to one of my co-contributors, and now it's being run by the people who are contributing to Zoom Hub, and we're still working on getting it up and running fully. If you were here a few weeks ago to hear Ken Perkins talk, he talked about doing the data migration for that, and we're still working on getting that up to being a full cloud-based image zooming service. Um, there's also Open Sea Dragon, which is the portion of the service that lets you look at cool zooming images. And there's Deep Zoom tools that lets you make them in the first place. So the whole point of this is that you can zoom and pan around big images, like you're used to being able to do with maps, right? Everybody does this now. Even five years ago, this wasn't the case. Not everybody had a smartphone. But now, probably all of you at some point today went like this <clears throat> to try and find your bus stop or figure out where this building was or something like that. And if you change your perspective just a little bit, you realize that a map is just a special case of a big image. So you have a representation of the Earth, a 3D object that you have projected onto a 2D surface in some way. And it's very, very large, and you can't look at the whole thing all at once. But you also can't get the level of detail that you want to think about when you're looking at the whole thing. So what do you need to do? You need to be able to zoom and pan around it in a way that lets you understand where you are on the thing, and that lets you look at the parts that you want to look at at any one time without having to keep track or keep in your head what the whole thing is like, right? So that's, that's the whole point of like Google Maps or whatever. But you can also do this with any image that you want. So I have an example here of one of the world's largest images that somebody, one of the world's largest photographs, excuse me. It's a stitched together panorama that was taken from the top of the BT Tower in London. And it's being quite slow. So, what somebody did is they went up to this tower in London and they took a panoramic photograph and they put it on the internet and it is 320 gigapixels in size. So you can see this thing, it looks like you're very high above, you know, a major city. But you can also zoom in. There we go. You can also zoom in really, really far. Yeah, what's that person doing? <laughs> right? And I, I just picked some spot in this image. The whole thing is like this. You could, you know, look into people's windows and front gardens and be really creepy if you wanted to. Or you could zoom all the way out and look at, you know, this whole sprawling metropolis. So my screen is not big enough to have a 320 gigapixel image on it just all at once. If you printed that thing out, I can't imagine how large it would be actually. It would, it would probably cover the floor of this building and more. And moreover, it's not a flat image. It's stitched together in a panorama. So you couldn't even print it out flat if you tried. 
So if I'm sitting here on this tiny little laptop and I want to get a good idea of what this thing even means and what its scale is like and what you can do with it, kind of the only way to do that is to zoom and pan around it. And that's why you want to have zooming and panning images. You can get lost in there. You can discover things that you didn't know about. So this brings me to something that I actually did work on. So that previous example, I, I had nothing to do with that. But I'll show you some things that are currently on ZoomIt right now. And when I was writing this talk on Tuesday morning, I popped open Google Analytics and I said, oh, what are people doing right now? What's, what, have, what have people decided to look at on ZoomIt today? So I have a poster of all the popes ever. Well, it's actually, it's actually missing one. We don't have um, the current pope in here because I guess this poster was made a few years ago. So there's, there's a space for him, though. So you can see that this is pretty big. I, I would imagine that it would cover a good portion of your wall if you had this in real life. But on the internet, you can zoom in and out and find your, your favorite pope and read all about him if you want. So somebody used zoom it to convert that. Um, somebody else put up their proposal for cool street art. And I like this one because it's sort of like a slide deck. It's, um, you, can, you can see that they probably had some kind of flow to present this to somebody or to talk about it in some way. So they have the site here and then you can zoom way in, you can pan over or zoom in over here. Well, it'll be easier to find this thing if I zoom out first, huh? But you have like their, their oscilloscope and some fabrication photos and a picture of the finished project of that thing. And uh, a lot of this is in Italian, so I don't really know what it says, but I, I searched for the name of the town in here, and it's kind of by the heel of the boot, in case you were wondering. And another thing is, of course, a map. So this looks like fun. It's one of those big maps that you have to fold out and look at, but you can't really do that on the internet. So this is a nice way of presenting that information in a way that you can explore. You can zoom around and pan and look at that. And then we have a class diagram of the, the JavaScript API for Office. So if you were looking to see how your binding class was going to relate to your document class, wonder no more. Now you know. So that's what, that's what 11 a.m. on Tuesday was about for ZoomIt. So how does this work? You're all wondering now. I'm sure you have some ideas. So let me pop open Firebug. So, and I'll refresh this so it gets it. So I have a viewer of this image here, right? And I have, look at all these requests. And as I zoom in, you can see more requests. And you can see there are file names in them. Look at all those go. OK. Each of these file names is one tile that's being requested by the viewer. So the viewer knows how big this image is. It has an idea of the dimensions of it. And it knows where it is within there. And it knows how, how, how far you've zoomed into the image as well. So it has a notion of a level and a place. So what it does is it requests the tiles for that level and place so that you get the appropriate level of detail in the appropriate spot and nothing more. So what you're doing is not requesting the whole image at one time. So if you have a, you know, gigapixels of stuff, you don't have to bring that all down over the internet to look at it. You're just requesting enough for you to look at. And this is exactly how maps online work. This is probably not new to anybody. But again, this is done with an image. So the steps to making these images, let's say that you took a giant photograph of the city of Seattle and now you want to put it online for everyone to look at. Or you, you have your amazing API documentation that everybody needs to know about. Um, first up, you have to break that image up into tiles that can be served in the way that I just described, right? Then you put all that on the internet somewhere. And then you have to point a, an open sea dragon viewer at it so that it knows which tiles to fetch, in what order, how to put them on the screen, and that you can zoom and pan around in, in a smooth way. 
And I actually have a sample set of tiles, in case you were wondering of how that all worked. So I have an image here. There's this little bit of XML that, that you can see. I'll open up Sublime here and open up this little bit of XML that's associated with this image so that you can know what it looks like. So here's an image that was processed by DeepZoom tools. You can see it has a width and a height, and you can see that it has a tile size. And so what I have here are the associated tiles with this thing at different levels. So at level 12, there's a whole bunch of them because you have to break up this 3,000 by 4,000 image or whatever into 256 by 256 tiles. So you see they look like that. And as you make the levels smaller, you get fewer and fewer tiles. And now at level eight, you're zoomed out enough that the whole thing fits on one, right? So where did my presentation go? There it is. Okay. So that's, that's what it looks like behind the scenes. That's what an image looks like when you convert it into something that can be used by this thing. So again, what am I gonna talk about? Deep Zoom Tools is the part that does the breaking up into tiles part. That's hosted on GitHub as Deep Zoom Tools and that's written in Node. And so what you can do is take your image to that and say, okay, I have this, usually you wanna use the default tile size and zoom it doesn't do anything but the default tile size right now in the default format, but you can use different tile sizes and formats for different reasons that you might want. Um, and you say, okay, break it up into tiles, give me this image pyramid is usually what we call it. And then Open Sea Dragon is written in straight JavaScript and it's the viewer part. It knows what to do with one of these tiles or one of these image pyramids. So you give it a tile source and we, we call these a DZI, a deep zoom image. So you give it a link to a tile source and it knows what to do with it and it can zoom and pan around in there. And Zoom Hub is a cloud-based service that connects these all up together. So the ultimate goal of Zoom Hub is to have a REST API. You can give it a URL. It, it points to an image. It takes that image, processes it, through, processes it through Deep Zoom tools, stores the image pyramid in the cloud for you, and then gives you a link that you can get as a Sea Dragon viewer from. And so that's what these are right here. Somebody had an original image. They used the REST API on ZoomIt and got this shortened URL to a little viewer. And you can embed this on a web page too if you want. So a lot of this used to be part of Microsoft. Um, like I said before, we got ZoomIt open sourced very recently and Zoom Hub is still a work in progress. If you wanna contribute to it, that would be amazing. Um, that goes for all three of these. We, we welcome co-contributors and we're still working on it. And that is all I have for right now. So if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. I can go into more technical stuff if you want, um, talk a little bit more about what people might use this for. Yes? What are the next steps with it? Do you mean with all three of them or just with Zoom it or? Um, anything that comes to mind. Anything that comes to mind? Um, well, recently, I think mostly what we're working on right now is adding features that existed in the, the Microsoft clients, like the, the Microsoft software that we spent a lot of time on. Um, and we're sort of adding those back in. So for example, Open Sea Dragon just recently got collections added to it, which is, that means that you can take a bunch of images that are pyramided in this way, put them into a collection, and you can arrange them in different ways on the screen if you want, or you can zoom and pan between them, and that kind of thing. Um, Zoom Hub, we still want to get it accepting new images and having more of the old images hosted on the, the new open source site. So that's kind of, that's kind of my, where, where I'm interested. And fixing bugs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yes? How do you convert a regular image into the pyramid image? Is it sort of a drag and drop thing? Like, oh, this picture of a 
dog looks like it's making a pyramid image, you just drag it over and it does it? Or how is that set up? How, how is the image conversion set up? So what you have to do is you take the regular image and you divide it up into smaller images. Um, and then you do that over and over, having downsampled the regular one to get the, the, the levels. So it's more of like a pixel pushing experience and like a image chopping experience than like a drag and drop thing or anything like that. Yeah, Deep Zoom Tools does that. Deep Zoom Tools does that, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that was a specially made tool to do, to do that because there's not really, I, I feel like that has traditionally been the biggest hurdle for users is like there's not really a thing that does that. So Deep Zoom Tools does that. Yeah. Uh, I just like to start by saying that TED Talk I've seen it is my absolute favorite all time TED Talk. Cool. Um, what I'm curious about is how does the OpenSea Dragon compare to using, say, Leaflet? Uh, um, so uh, yeah, they're, they're similar technologies. I don't know if Leaflet supports images other than maps. I don't know that much about Leaflet. Yeah. Um, Ian has his hand up, so maybe he knows. So if, if you couldn't hear Ian's response, it's that um, in Leaflet, you can only zoom to the exact level that they have imagery for. So let's say I zoom something in on that, that Sea Dragon viewer. Maybe I can, you know. Let's say that I really, really want to look at, I don't know, this right here. And let's say that was between levels 10 and 11. Leaflet would snap it, snap the image somewhere, maybe here or maybe there in, in a place that you didn't exactly want to have. And that can be annoying for users in that they, they want to look at this specific thing framed in a specific way. And also a lot of people embed these in websites and they want to have like a particular thing showing at particular brown boundaries at a particular time. Yes? On the server side, which technology is the fastest to process the images? I'm not actually sure. Um, Deep Zoom Tools is set up so that it can use either VIPS or Image Magic, and I think VIPS is. I've, I've heard that VIPS is like the fastest. Uh, I mean, it outperforms all, all the Python, you know, uh, any other thing that I've seen so far. Yeah, I, I get the impression from talking to the person who's worked the most on the Deep Zoom tools that VIPS is better. It also seems to have better memory management. Like I was having this conversation with him about you know, whether or not we might run out of memory because we're, we're using this in Node, right? And I don't know how many requests we're getting for, for image conversions, but it seems to be less of a worry with VIPS. Um, way back in the day when the Deep Zoom tools were first implemented, it was in C Sharp and we kept hitting this bug in GDI Plus where you couldn't take, it couldn't handle more than two gigabytes of data at one time. And of course, if you had more than a two gigapixel image, which is like the whole point, it, it, was, it was a problem. I saw another hand, yes. Is there a JavaScript API to the control embedded to use on the client? I mean, you can send it commands. Um, I don't know if you want to talk more about that, Ian, because yeah. you would know a little more. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a little bit with that, but not, not as much as some other folks. Anybody else? Yes? Yeah. Uh, so I can see a very direct comparison satellite view, but the not satellite view, like, there's a lot of dynamic stuff on there. So are they starting out with an image that's like, kind of like this and they're overlaying like, all this other stuff onto it, or is it all the same that's a, that's a good point. I'm not actually sure. So what, what he said is that I'm comparing it to maps, but really it's more like the satellite view, which is true because the satellite view is an image and probably the other, like, 
what they're doing with Google Maps, like probably if you're just looking at the road view, I would, if it were me, I'd make it an SVG. I don't know what they're doing exactly because I, I just don't know. But there, there are a lot of problems with maps that are really specific to them, like labeling, for example. Like you have to have your labels be the right size at different levels. You, you can't just have like some giant label there and have it zoom in and out because that totally doesn't work. Yes? How well does it work with responsive websites? I actually have no idea. <laughs> that is a great question. I, I'd say it works well in the sense that you can fit it to whatever window size you have and then it gives the content appropriately. Uh, and it is, Open Sea Dragon does support touch gestures, so. Um, so Ian made the point that you, it zooms appropriately to the size that you set it at and Open Sea Dragon supports touch. You can tell probably from the way that we're answering questions, I have a much better idea about the back end and Ian has a much better idea about the front end. Yes? Are you guys doing anything with any GIS companies or like Esri? Are, are we doing anything with like GIS companies or Esri? No. no, nothing like that. That could be cool, but no. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you, everybody.